Shooting it raw? Yes. Shooting it raw. Uh, this is called TEDx ABQ. Is that the one you want to talk about? Yes, that's that's the third one. Okay, so um, I have to describe it. It it looks like a screenshot of now. Is that you on stage? Yes. Nice. Yes. Okay, so it's a screenshot of a, I guess of you speaking at a TEDx. Um, I guess ABQ stands for Albuquerque. Yes. And then, so you're wearing, uh, the, it's very stark. So the it's black, 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 except for you lit with like stage lighting. You're wearing a, a very nice white f- fanning out to red dress. Your eyes are closed. You have the little TEDx mic uh, on your cheek. Your eyes are closed. You have your two hands crossed over your chest. And to the left of you, like graphically designed or whatever, it says, all too often... My black patients, especially teenage boys, revealed that racism has convinced them that nothing is their way except for an early grave through violence. My patients were told they didn't have a future. And that says your name. Very powerful. So take it from there, please. So the the title of my talk was I Am. And in the talk, I begin with Mandy, who was my first ancestor, um, African ancestor in America. And I describe her naming ceremony. And it starts out, imagine the midnight sky, the white moon shining its mysterious smile on the baby girl cradled in the arms of an old man. So it, it goes on to say that this, this old man is her father's father. And this is a, an a African tradition. And he has spent weeks figuring out the names that would endow her with the qualities he wanted her to have as she grew up. And as I started to say earlier, we know that one of those qualities was the ability to believe in herself. And and because we see it in her descendants. And when she was about 13 years old, she was abducted and became nameless until the Madisons of Virginia renamed her Mandy. But she never spoke out loud her real name, because that name had a secret power that told her that no one could truly own her because her life was hers. And she said, crossing her hands, I am. And her enslaved descendants also said, I am. And they said it to mean, I am not property. Mm -hmm. And then I take it down to myself a hundred years later, and I describe an experience in a drugstore. I went for a job interview. I had applied, I was a teenager, um, I was 17 years old, and I had seen an ad in a drugstore and you know, I buffed up my white suede sh- uh, Oxford shoes and ironed my blouse and, you know, looking really very neat and spiffy and felt very confident. Mm-hmm. But the, the owner took one look at me and said, I ain't about to have no colored gal working in my store. Mm. And I said, your loss, which is my way of saying I am. Yeah, for sure. And at the, we should do the end of my TED talk and I, maybe your, maybe your listeners will do it too, right where they are. So at the end of my TED talk, 
I say, there are countless ways to say I am. And then I say, I am, I am, I am, you know, kind of snooty way, like I did Mm -hmm. when I told this guy, you're lost. And then I say, so I want you right where you are in any way you choose and as loud as you're comfortable doing to say, I am. And I count. Ready? One, two, three. And then I point to the audience and everybody goes, I am. So you're supposed to do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. I was, okay. Well, I, was, I, I didn't know you were setting me up to actually say it. But go ahead. Now if you say it, I will definitely say it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because all of us have gone through some tough times. All of us have ancestors who have gone through some tough times and they made it primarily because they believed in themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think we can all remember, I am. Now, the book that you wrote, so to be an author is to claim authority, is to claim ownership of a narrative is to sort of say, well, of all the things that could be said, this is how I am going to best tell my story or whatever it is. And itself is uh, a long drawn, sometimes it takes a year, sometimes it takes three years, some people it takes five years. Like, it's basically a focused effort to say I am, however it is. And so, how has your staking that flag in, in the ground? I'm going to mix me- metaphors, so just stick with me. How is staking that me- that flag in the ground and saying, "I am, I am here, I am my"? I, you're claiming your agency, but you're also claiming the story of your family for your family, um, which is what your your mom kind of nudged you in that direction. So what has been the response from the world around you? Oh, let me just make a couple of comments. First, it, it took me 30 years to write this book. Nice. So <laughs> one message I have is, you know, if, if, if you have something important that you want to do, just stick with it. Mm-hmm. I mean, even though at times you might think I'm crazy to keep this up for 30 years. Um, and the, the other thing is, I like the way you said that my book says I am. So that mm-hmm. that TED Talk came after my book. Nowhere mm-hmm. in the book do I say I I am. Nowhere in the mm-hmm. book do I put those, put it to words in that way. What I am doing in the book is to say that enslaved people were remarkable individuals Mm -hmm. who oh for sure never lost a sense of their own humanity even though sometimes Mm -hmm. they were treated worse than property Mm -hmm. you know they were beaten starved sold you know away from their their families and their homes but they never lost their sense of I am. Now, that's like mm-hmm. I said, that, that is not in the book. The I am is not in the book. But the, their sense of being human beings, their sense of hope, no matter how distant it might be, and no matter whether it may not, it may not even happen in this life. Mm. So enslaved people um, were strong believers in God and, you know, and and, um, a better life Mm -hmm. after death, but they, they always had a sense that they were more, that they were not less than anyone than anyone else, and the and and also they had a lot of talents and they contributed 
to this country and the world mm-hmm. in every human endeavor you can think of. Mm-hmm. Everything. And, you know, arts, music, science, anything you can think of. Sure. Enslaved people contributed and they passed down those same qualities to their descendants, including those of us alive today, which includes my 11-year-old granddaughter. So when, when do you feel that your family history, because in a way it's all like, you know, when previous guests on the podcast have talked about intergenerational trauma and and myself growing up, you know, we have our family histories. We have our, the stories that get passed around. And, and, but when would you say that your sense of your place within the kind of the timeline of your family really gelled? And in a way, that is one of the things you've been carrying with you. Uh, yeah, like wh- what age would you say that? You had a clear understanding, like, oh, wait a second, my 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 family history is exceptionally, not necessarily exceptionally, because like, unfortunately in the U.S. it's not exceptional. There's way way too many families um, who who were scarred from you know slavery. But then, when would you say your awareness of that really gelled? It ha- you know it happened during my research and it you know it was an evolution okay media will play louder <laughs> Is it, was it, was it, what was that <laughs> i don't know <laughs> that was great okay we keep going i'm in my son-in-law's office i don't know <laughs> that's awesome okay keep going <laughs> <laughs> broke the tension a little bit but uh, keep going yeah, um, it, you know, it it was an evolution, but I think I think it was when I was in Elmina Castle in Ghana, mm-hmm. and I was standing in the courtyard below the governor's living quarters, and the story there about that 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 courtyard or that that area of the courtyard is that the governor of Elmina would have his soldiers bring in a bunch of enslaved women so that he could choose the one that he wanted to rape. And so there I am standing in that same spot Mm-hmm. And I was in a I was in a, a mixed group um, racially and you know gender wise just, just you know a, a group of, of uh, tourists, but I felt like I was standing among a group of prospects that the governor was sur- surveying, and I could feel the fear. Mm-hmm. that Mandy and the other enslaved women must have felt knowing why why they were standing there and what was to happen next and being mm-hmm. totally defenseless well wow. yeah i think i think that was the moment well that's yeah, definitely a visceral connection. And so as you're you're saying this, you're also connecting, you know, because the, the, my anchor, I, was, I see you on the screen because we're talking, but I'm also seeing the image of you standing with your eyes closed, your hands on your chest. I mean, I assume telling the audience, say, I am, um, to sort of basically claim your own authority and your own agency. So how... How would you step from there to the next photo? So is life really a gift? Really? Can you make every second count? 
That's the whole point of the podcast. So if you like what you've seen and you're inspired, because that really is my mission, then please give it a like, subscribe, and share. Shooting it raw? Yes. Shooting it raw.